The Luminists didn't go searching for spectacle. They used what was on their doorstep. In Fitzhugh Lane's case, a narrow slice of coast around Gloucester, Massachusetts, with its tidal bays, its rocks and shipping. But to most Americans, such images would have looked like dreams in a backwater. A new industrial America was rising from the ashes of the Civil War, driven by the railroad. In the 1850s, America had just 9,000 miles of track. By the end of the 1870s, it had 93,000. Railroads crossed the continent. They opened the West, and artists rode them along with the land speculators, con men and gamblers. They too were ready to mine the landscape. The steam train becomes the symbol of American progress. Its headlamp is the star of empire. It moves irresistibly through glorious landscapes. The old Conestoga wagon lumbers along while the new train hurtles to its destination. Dropping their images of settlers' wagons, Courier and Ives took the railroad engine as the triumph of enterprise. Its smoke blinds the American Indians, blotting them out. Painters went west to satisfy the growing curiosity back east for images of the distant frontier, which had become feverish through tall stories and journalists' hype. Foremost among them was Albert Bierstadt, an immigrant from Germany who made a three-decade career out of grandiose western landscape. Bierstadt was a tireless self-promoter, and he claimed to capture the west as it really was. This, he declared, was a minutely faithful account of the daily life of the Shoshone Indians in the Rocky Mountains. Maybe so, but the whole landscape is invented, and as for the Indians, Bierstadt had plans for them. He announced that one day, in the foreground of his painting, a city populated by our descendants may rise, and in its art galleries this picture may eventually find its resting place. Bierstadt's Rockies only look wild. Actually, they promised complete control of territory. The thought behind them was the exact opposite of the beliefs that Indians held about their own relationship to the land. The Native American view is that this place uh, is very much a part of a great sacred totality. My people, who were the, the hunters, did not paint landscapes. In fact, very few tribes painted landscapes. That's a very foreign idea, you know. This was a part of the great holy, and you lived here, and you perhaps emulated portions of the environment. For example, the eagle feather headdress placed upon the head of, a, of a, an elected leader. The eagle flies high in the heavens near the sun. It's believed because it flies that high that it too has a sacred potency related to the sun. Consequently, the eagle feathers placed in a, in a particular arrangement become the rays of the sun coming out of the man's head, and he's told to be as a father to your people, just as the sun is a father to this universe. So we see uh, uh, a slightly different interpretation of nature in that uh, the, it becomes the living forces that control us, and we therefore pay homage to those potencies by adorning ourselves with those essences or those symbols. The 
Railroads built the West. They created the myth of the West and fixed it in popular fantasy. Their promoters had to find new destinations. In fact, they created them. Nowhere is this plainer than in the story of Yellowstone. From the white world, only a few trappers and mountain men had ever visited this weird thermal landscape. They returned with stories of a place where hell bubbled up, Satan's cauldron. Their stories of geysers and rivers of boiling water were too wild to be believed back east. In 1871, an official US geological survey team led by Ferdinand Hayden set out for Yellowstone. Hayden knew he would need pictures, not just words, to describe it. So he took along a 34-year-old artist, Thomas Moran. Moran's trip was underwritten by the Northern Pacific Railroad, which guessed that his images just might create a new tourist destination. Back east, Moran's watercolours thrilled their audience, rather as the first photos from the moon would a century later. Along with Moran, Hayden had invited a former stagecoach driver turned photographer, William Henry Jackson. This was the first time in America that a photographer and an artist had worked together on the same project. Jackson provided the objective record of this world of wonders to a public which thought the camera couldn't lie. His photographs didn't undercut Moran's sketches, they confirmed them. Moran often helped Jackson find scenes for his camera and then he painted them himself. Hayden used their work to persuade Congress that Yellowstone should be protected forever. He wanted to create America's first national park. It was a view of the Canyon Falls that established Moran in the public eye. It was the summation of his trip his all-out gamble with public taste, the big picture, as he called it. He painted it when he got back, and Congress loved it. Thomas Moran's enormous picture of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone was the first American landscape by an American artist to be bought by the American government. It cost $10,000, or about 80 cents a square inch. It would have been cheap at twice the price. They put it in the Capitol, where so many effigies of flesh and blood heroes already hung. And this, too, in its way, was a painting of a hero. The landscaper's hero. Limbs of rock, belly of water, hair of trees. It offered the panoramic thrill that no watercolour can give, and the density of substance that no photograph can rival. Moran didn't try for literal transcription of nature. Jackson's photography had shown him what the camera couldn't do, and Turner, whose pictures he had seen in England and adored, had taught him what painting could suggest. In 1872, the year Moran's canvas was finished, the Yellowstone area became a national park. Moran's painting didn't force the bill through Congress, but it did become the prime symbol of wilderness tourism, and it did wonders for the cash flow of the Northern Pacific Railroad. After Yellowstone came other national parks. But while the public taste for these wilderness museums grew and grew, the popularity of epic landscape declined.
By the 1890s, the likes of Moran and Church were seen as the remnants of a mode of landscape painting that was too big, too naive, too much all round.